Good evening and welcome to the October 11th, 2023 meeting of the Lower Merion Board of Commissioners. We have four committee meetings this evening. We have the Administrative and Human Resources Committee, the Public Works Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Building and Planning Committee. But before we begin our committee meetings for this evening, I would like to make a few comments on behalf of the board regarding the situation in Israel. All of us are saddened and angered by the recent attacks on Israel and condemn the horrific acts of terrorism there. And we mourn the loss of all innocent lives of any nationality or religion. Here at home, many of our residents have friends, relatives, and colleagues who have been directly affected by these recent events or who are currently at risk. Our hearts are with yours in this difficult time. We are living in troubled times with more wars, greater domestic unrest, heightened discord, and alarming increases in hate speech. In Lower Marion, we stand firm in defense of our values, peace and kindness rather than violence and hatred, understanding rather than distrust, being welcoming to all persons, regardless of faith, race, creed, background, sexual orientation, or anything really. We also recognize that Lower Marion has numerous synagogues and Jewish places of worship, as well as a large number of residents who understandably feel personally at risk in light of the attack on Israel. This Board of Commissioners wants to reassure our friends, neighbors, and constituents that Lower Marion Township will not stand for hatred of any kind and will do everything in our power to protect and to support our residents. Thank you. With that, we have the first committee meeting for this evening. That's the Administrative and Human Resources Committee. And I recognize its chair, Commissioner Churchill. Thank you very much. We have two items on our agenda tonight. <clears throat> the first one is from time to time, we dispose of public records. Uh, and uh, let me just put this uh, uh, open for discussion. Consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners adoption of a resolution authorizing disposal of certain public records in accordance with the schedules and procedures as set forth in the municipal record manual approved by the Pennsylvania Local Government Records Committee on December 16th, 2008 and amended March 28th, 2019. Oh, Do I have a second? second. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would just ask uh, our township manager, we uh, store most of these documents. Are we running out of s storage space <laughs> electronically? We, well, not electronically. We are constantly running out of physical space. So that's why we, when we dispose of the physical records, we have to bring these via resolution to you for approval. Some records where they're important are, are stored electronically as well, but even when we're destroying the, those <coughs> paper records, we still have to come to you with a resolution. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do any of the commissioners have any questions? Seeing none, the audience, do they have any questions on this? Seeing none, I would ask for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand, say aye. aye. Those who are opposed, Seeing none, those who are abstaining, seeing none, this passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, the second item is a reappointment to the Human Relations Commission. And I would just add, uh, put a motion uh, before us. Consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners the retroactive reappointment of Gina Lee to a three-year three -year term, such term, to expire September 2026. Do I have a second? second. Thank you very <clears throat> much, Commissioner Grimes. Um, is there anyone from the Human Relations Committee that would like to comment on this? Um, seeing none, do the commissioners have any question about this? Seeing none, does the public have any commit? Excuse me. Uh, public have uh, any comment on this reappointment? Seeing none, I would ask uh, for a vote for the commissioners. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, seeing none. Those abstaining, seeing none. 
This passes unanimously, and that concludes the business of the Administration and Human Resource Committee. Mr. President. Thank you very much, Commissioner <coughs> Churchill. Uh, the next committee on the agenda is the Public Works Committee. I recognize its chair, Commissioner McKeon. Thank you very much, President Sinai. There's just one agenda item on the Public Works Committee uh, agenda tonight, and that's an appointment to the Shade Tree Commission. So to get things moving, I will move to consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners appointment of Andrea Gallagher to the Shade Tree Commission for a five-year term, such term to expire October 2028. Second, thank you, Commissioner McComb. Um, and I'll just make a couple quick comments about Ms. Gallagher. Uh, she's a registered professional civil engineer, former director, uh, former assistant director of the Lower Marion Public Works uh, Department, longtime township resident who, who lives in Belmont Hills. I was very excited uh, to, to have her come out and apply. I think there's uh, a lot that she can really uh, offer the township and, and a lot of expertise in this area. So again, very, very excited about her application. And I'd really be remiss if we didn't mention the other two candidates too. I thought we had two other really exceptional candidates who applied at the same time. And unfortunately there was only one opening, but um, there may be vacancies in 2024 or thereafter. So I would just, my message to those other applicants would be to uh, stay engaged because there could be other opportunities in the ad hoc, um, committee was very impressed with the credentials uh, of all the candidates. Uh, so without any commissioner questions or comments, uh, Commissioner O'Neill. Oh, thank you. Just a comment. Um, how pleased I am that it's um, Andrea Gallagher who's applied and will hope presumably be um, voted into the Shade Tree Commission as one of our members. I can't imagine a better liaison to staff given her role and you know, getting through some rocky roads over the past year or two. And she always said such a steady head and I full heartedly support this. So thank you for, thank you for her for wanting it and for bringing it forward. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions or comments? Okay. Uh, is there any public comment in the room? And Jody, no public comment? No one's online. Okay, great. All right, uh, well, with that, I will call it to a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, and any opposed? All right, with that, Madam Secretary, the motion passes unanimously, and President Sana, that concludes the business of the Public Works Committee. Thank you very much, Commissioner McKinnon. We now turn to the Finance Committee, and tonight, chairing the Finance Committee will be the Vice Chairperson, Commissioner Ray Courtney. Thank you, President Sinai. Uh, tonight, we are going to start with a quick presentation. Uh, emphasis on quick, right? Uh, continuing our, our budget workshop. All right, so I am going to be very quick tonight. I'm basically just going to report out on a couple of issues. Uh, the first being uh, insurance renewals. We talked about this at the budget workshop. We didn't have final numbers. We got some good numbers in terms of our health insurance. Uh, that premium increase is very reasonable. We got even worse numbers than I anticipated uh, on property insurance. Those numbers were quite high based upon the market overall. Um, so that will have a little bit of a budgetary impact. Uh, workers comp was more modest, but just kind of to report out to the board, we'll incorporate these into the proposed budget. And then just one other issue, um, and this is actually different slightly than what was in your packet. Um, so uh, fire company allocations, just the update is really that second bullet. So our external auditor is very close to completion. We have five of six of the financial reviews totally done. Uh, the one remaining has a very small item. We hope it will be completed this week. Uh, and no change to the information that the board received in September. Um, so you have some information on, on here. I know we don't have the full board with us, um, so at least my intent is to uh, keep the 3% uh, into the proposed budget and have the board will address this through the budget adoption process. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, before we jump into the conversation, uh, I want to recognize the vice chair of the fire committee, uh, just to touch on the fire company allocations, Commissioner McComb. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Courtney. Uh, I'm going to move that we table um, Commissioner questions and comments about the allocation as I'm the only member of the fire committee here tonight. Uh, Commissioner uh, Zeloff and Commissioner Bernheim have, have asked to be tabled. Also, they've asked staff to engage with the fire committee to go over the numbers that have been reported by the fire companies. And as Eric has said, they're, 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 that review is underway, but I think it'll be a better conversation if we have the fire committee here and we have an opportunity to hear further on that discussion. So I would move that we table that discussion. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McComb. I don't think we actually have to make a formal motion since we're not voting or there's no resolution, resolution tonight. So assuming no one ob objects to skipping that part of the conversation, let's keep our any questions or comments focused on the first slide around, around the insurance premiums. Uh, do any, does anyone on the board have comments or questions for Eric? Can I ask this a question? Do you have an anticipate when we'll, we're going to have a chance to discuss this? Discuss what? What we were going to discuss tonight. The fire? Yeah. I do not believe that would be until the November Finance Committee at the earliest, because this is the last Finance Committee until November 11th, I believe it is, right, Ernie? Yes. Eighth. November 8th. November 8th. Eighth. Sorry. November 8th, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's what it is. Record, would you just vote on that? Second, second on the motion. Sure, I'll second the motion. Uh, it's a motion to table, so there's no discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, is there any discussion on the other portion tonight, the insurance premiums? Any public comment? Is there anyone online, Jody? There is no online. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that, we will conclude the uh, budget workshop uh, continuation, and then we'll move on to our second agenda item, uh, an award of contract for pickleball courts. Yes, yeah, so this is one pickleball court and reconstruction of one basketball court. Uh, short story, five bidders. The lowest two bidders were both very close, both below budget, both known vendors. Uh, go with the lowest bidder. Um, that's basically it. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions for our CFO? All right. Is there any public comment on this matter? Uh, we did receive written public comment of support from Michael Pollock of Ardmore. All right. Uh, I'll put the motion on the floor, which is uh, I move that we consider for recommendation of the Board of Commissioners approval to award a contract for construction of Ashbridge Memorial Park pickleball courts and reconstruction of Wynwood Valley Park basketball court to the following bidder, LB Construction Enterprises, Inc., in accordance with bids received uh, and a recommendation of the Chief Financial Officer with the approval of the Director of Parks and Rec and the Township Engineer. I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, with that, then I'll call the vote. All, All those, those in favor, favor, please raise your hand. Your hand. Aye. Any, Any opposed? opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries. Moving on. Uh, when I first read this, I thought it said lead consultant, but I believe it's for a lead consultant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so th this item is a contract award for necessary services within the CDBG program. Uh, Plymouth Environmental has done quality work for the township for, uh, I think, nearly a decade on lead, reme lead remediation issues. Um, looking forward, the township, just based upon its projects it has and its, and its rehab program, is anticipating a higher need for lead abatement work. Um, so that's uh, part of the reason why we're looking forward to getting this contract settled. Uh, you have an issue briefing before you. We do recommend moving forward. Uh, and Ms. Crane is available if you have any detailed questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to the board. Are there any questions on this contract? All right, moving right along. Any public comment? Uh, again, Mr. Michael Pollock of Ardmore uh, emailed us that he is in support. Uh, I will move that we consider for recommendation of the Board of Commissioners approval to award a contract for lead remediation services to Plymouth Environmental with the recommendation of the CFO and the Director of Building and Planning. Do I have a second? Commissioner Grimes, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Right, I feel like an auctioneer. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Another contract for a viewshed consultant. All right, so this one, the board previously approved uh, work for phase one of this uh, uh, scenic corridor and viewshed uh, work. Um, this is a continuation of this work with the same consultant. Uh, the vendor has uh, done a quality job. The township staff has been happy with them. Uh, the project is nearing completion, uh, at least the first phase. Um, similar terms as the first phase in terms of 
Uh, there is a state grant that will fund the majority of this work. Uh, the township's expense is only $7,500 uh, when all is said and done, and that's already included within the draft uh, budget request that the board has reviewed back in, uh, in September. Uh, there's a detailed issue briefing in the packet. I believe Greg is here. If there are any questions or detailed questions, I cannot answer. Thank you. $7,500 sounds like a pretty small sum. Any questions on this one? Any public comment? Please, Ms. Gill. Maura Gill in Haverford. Um, I raised some issues with this one when I saw the proposal for phase one. And without having seen the results of phase one or what's being offered is ter in terms of guidance for phase two, I'm just that much more concerned. I believe that we are conflating what should be open space with historic. Understand that this is under the Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission grants for certified local governments. And there's definitely a need for us to do some work to make sure that whatever we're protecting related to historic resources is, is properly regulated. But if we're also going to look at view sheds writ large, scenic, then there's more to it than, than just the historic. And I don't see where that's clarified here in this issue briefing. I'd like to see what um, has been done with phase one and what the guidance is for phase two before this moves forward. Thank you, Ms. Gillen. Any other public comment? We received written public comment from Mr. Pollock that he's also in favor of this one. Uh, would anyone from staff like to comment on the results of phase one? Sure, Commissioner, I'd be happy to. Um, Thank you. As um, I think I explained when phase one of this project came forward, we, we always envisioned this as a single project, not split up into phases. Um, the state could only award us the grant money for the first half of the project initially. Um, thankfully, they did uh, um, award us the second half um, in, in the second year of the project. And um, we um, have been in contact constantly with the consultant. We've been reviewing their work and their mapping uh, work and, uh, and uh, we're impressed with um, what they've been doing. Uh, the end of phase one, isn't resulting in the creation of any kind of deliverable that we can really um, present to you or to show, but we, um, uh, well, you can rest assured that we can, we have been keeping in touch with them and uh, we're, um, like I said, impressed with what they've done at this point. So it's safe to say there's no cause for concern or reason why we might pause at this moment? Not from our perspective, okay. no. Did you have I can just add, the, the scenic view shed study, um, the, for this grant, um, is for is building on something that was originally adopted by the township in 1993. There is an existing scenic view shed and corridor study that was worked out that identified view sheds throughout the township. The consultant is going in and looking at those to make sure they're still viable and then identifying any new ones that come forward. So we actually have a lot of work from them from identifying those areas. The second piece will really be getting to the guts of that about how do we regulate those. Mm -hmm. There is, admittedly, I think with, with Ms. Gillen points out, there is an overlap between open space and historic preservation, but the scenic view shed character is, it's, while it's not strictly historic, it falls under that and it solves, I think, the same purpose that we're trying to reach at the same time. I don't, we don't see any harm in that at all. And I don't think there's really a, a natural division to say something's open space or something's historic preservation. It's all about the scenic character of the, of the community. Um, if anybody's interested in the existing scenic view shed study, it's actually been added. It's in the comprehensive plan in the community facilities section. You'll see there's a couple maps in there that identify what that is so everybody can get an idea of what, what it looks like now. But then we'll have ways that we can actually protect these instead of just putting one on a map and saying these are nice places of view sheds. Great. Thank, thank you for that explanation. Commissioner O'Neill, before I recognize you, why don't I just go ahead and make the motion? Uh, I'll move that we consider for recommendation of the Board of Commissioners approval to enter into a contract with Paula Sokolowski and Sartor LLC for phase two of new scenic corridor and view shed study with the recommendation of the CFO and the Director of Building and Planning. Second, Commissioner O'Neill. And with that, I will recognize Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you so much. Just a quick question uh, for staff. Um, we have talked in the past couple of years the desire for us to do some sort of a, um, a view shed but through like a by, byway, sort of scenic byway. Um, do you take this into consideration in this study or can we, 
you know, it's a federal designate, you know, these are designated federal pieces of roadway that are byways for scenery. And sometimes they're in the middle of Alaska or they're in the middle of Yosemite, but oftentimes they can be in suburban corridors. They do exist. Um, and I think that that really anchors the space and the grandeur that we're looking for. I don't know whether or not we could include that or I would love to see that. We're, I think when you see this product, you'll be very pleased with that. What this is looking at is individual scenic views and individual properties, but it's also looking at corridors, much like a byway. But we would be looking at these at the local level, not the national level. A lot of times when you're at the national level, you have certain the national level of land use control is different from municipal, right? So we'll be looking then at this and saying that if these are valuable areas, how should we preserve them? We don't know that yet, and that's really what the second piece of this is, is coming up with some of those ideas for strategies for, re for preserving them. Some of it could be regulatory, some of it could be by other means, but that's what this consultant will be looking at. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Sure. Any other comment or questions on the motion? All right, with that, I will call up the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have uh, another disposal authorization of surplus township equipment. Uh, yes, so when you dispose of township equipment over uh, assumed um, value, you have to approve it via resolution. We did this once earlier this year. This will be our second auction this year, trying to create a little room for hopefully our new equipment to come in. Um, you have the list before you. Um, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions uh, you might have on any equipment, but we recommend moving forward. All right, are there any questions for the CFO on this matter? Any public comment? Uh, this is another item that has received the support of Mr. Pollock from Arden. Uh, so I'll put the motion on the floor once the web page loads again for me. Back to cover sheet. Thank you. We'll go the old fashioned way. Uh, I move that we consider for recommendation of the Board of Commissioners approval to dispose of surplus township equipment by public auction or in the event of unsatisfactory or lack of bids, the CFO shall have the authority to arrange for disposal or rebid at a future date. Do I have a second? Thank you, Commissioner Sean Kramer. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next up we have the reappointment of a pension trustee. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Mark Keating is our longest tenured member on our pension board. Um, he has lots of institutional knowledge of the uh, pension board, how uh, pensions are funded, uh, a great deal of knowledge about uh, the overall um, both equity and fixed income markets. Uh, he's a vital member of this board and we're happy to have him continue for another three years. Thank you. Any questions? Any public comment? Uh, I have a motion. I move that we consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners the retroactive reappointment of Mark Keating, whose term expired in September, to serve the Police Pension Fund and the Employee Pension Fund as a trustee for a three-year term expiring in September of 2026. Second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill, for the second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, please, briefly, Commissioner. I'm on the, the uh, police pension fund. Uh, Mr. Keating is a very valuable member. His institutional knowledge is, is very helpful, so I urge that we vote favorably on this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McComb. Anyone else on the motion? Uh, I agree with Commissioner McComb. I, I think maintaining institutional knowledge, having someone who has served us before, is a great asset in this area. Uh, were Commissioner Zeloff here, I'm sure he would elaborate uh, in a much longer <laughs> fashion uh, to the merits of Until this. Until the eighth inning. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going for 715. All right. So uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposition? Motion carries. All right. Uh, we have a resolution on the State Act 205 pension. Yes, yeah, so this is an annual resolution the board uh, has to adopt every October. Uh, there are really two points to this. The first is to distribute the current year pension state aid to the two pension plans. The second is to set employee contributions 
to those pension plans for the next year being 2024. The good news is that the pension state aid uh, was higher than anticipated. The unit value went up about 12.5%, so that meant 12.5% uh, versus the prior year. So when the unit value goes up, that means the amount of money we have to put in from the general fund goes down. Um, the opposite thing happened in 2020 and 2021, but we're on a two-year positive streak and hopefully it will continue into the future. Uh, what that equates to is budgetary savings to the township of about $363,000 in the 2023 budget versus what was budgeted. Um, that will also help us out in terms of 2024 because generally the pension state aid uh, is generally pretty stable, does not decline. So the recommendation from our township actuary is to budget the same unit value each year. So maybe about two weeks ago, I dropped the 2024 budgeted pension <coughs> contribution when we got the state aid. So that's positive as well. Um, other just background information, the board did receive the MMOs. That's basically the pension bill for 2024. You received that from the township manager at the end of September. Um, and the rest of the resolution goes through uh, the actual employee contribution amounts for 2024. Those are all in accordance with the uh, labor agreements that the board approved earlier this year. Uh, we anticipate uh, that we'll be budgeting around $420,000 to fully fund the pension plans in 2024. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for the CFO on this matter? Any public comment? All right. Uh, I move that we consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners adoption of a resolution required by State Act 205 allocating pension state aid and setting employee contributions for 2024. Do I have a second? second. Thank you, Commissioner Gilda Kramer. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, I will say it's great that we are recognizing some savings here and I will make a mental note that we have an additional $363,000 to allocate carrying over from this year's budget. Uh, with that, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, the penultimate item on the agenda, a resolution around volunteer fire relief. Uh, so this actually comes from a similar pot of money as the pension state aid, comes around the same time. Um, this money, about 783000 uh, was about 1% or $8,000 less than last year. Um, however, last year was the highest ever amount, so this is still very significant funding for our volunteer firefighters. Um, and upon uh, adoption of the resolution, uh, township staff will then uh, transmit these funds over to the Volunteer Fire Relief Association. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for our CFO on this one? Any public comment? Jody, is there anyone online? No. All right. Uh, and uh, this is also an item that received the approval of Mr. Pollock from Hardline. Uh, so with that, I move that we consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners adoption of a resolution authorizing township staff to disperse the 2023 Commonwealth state aid allocation in the amount of $783,366.36 to the Lower Marion Firemen's Relief Association. Thank you for the second, Commissioner McComb. Any discussion on this motion? It is great to see uh, that the state has allocated more money for a, a worthy cause. Uh, with that, I call the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries. And last on our agenda, an authorization to advertise our budget and CIP hearings. Now, this is just an annual item. You just need to advertise and set those hearings. Nothing more, nothing less with this item. I'm going to assume there's no questions since everyone's done this before. Uh, any public comment? No? Great. I move that we consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners authorizing the Township Secretary to advertise notice that the proposed 2024 budget and the proposed 2024 to 2029 capital improvement plan are available for public inspection and that two public hearings will be held on Wednesday, November 15th, 2023 at approximately 7.30 p.m. and Wednesday, November 29th, 2023 at approximately 6 p.m. Thank you for the second, Commissioner McKeon. Uh, any discussion on this one? 
All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposition? Any abstentions? Motion carries. President Sinai, that concludes the business of the Finance Committee a half hour ahead of schedule. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Courtney. Uh, I'll, I'll note that it was actually only 25 minutes ahead of schedule, but we're still grateful. Um, and we will turn to our final committee for this evening. That's the Building and Planning Committee. I recognize its chair, Commissioner Grimes. Thank you. Um, two items on the agenda. If anyone is here for number two, the Historical Commission application um, concerning 144 Radnor Street, that has been tabled at the request of the applicant, so we're not going to hear that one tonight. Um, the first item is a certificate of appropriateness, and I will move to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of a certificate of appropriateness as recommended by the Historical Architectural Review Board at their meeting held on October 3, 2023, for 27 West Lancaster Avenue, Ardmore Commercial Historic District, 23-14, approval to replace a slate and asphalt shingle roof with sh new sh asphalt shingle roofing with reused or new copper or bronze colored aluminum to be used for roof ridges, dormer caps, gutters, and flashing in all locations for the subcommittee to confirm final material selection and location, citing Secretary of the Interior's Standard 9. Is there a second? Thank you, Commissioner Churchill. Greg, would you like to, do you have a few things to say? Only oh. if you'd like me to speak oh, okay. or have questions. Well, uh, do any commissioners have questions or comments on this application? I see none in person or virtually. Is there any public comment on this application? Um, I, I see none. So I will call the vote. All those in favor, raise your hand signifying aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Um, moving to the next item on the agenda. Um, this is, uh, I am going to move to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval to authorize advertisement of an ordinance to amend Chapter 155 of the Code of the Township of Lower Marion entitled Zoning to provide a definition of multifamily housing, low income to permit LM, LIMH and the MDR2 residence district to provide side yard setback, building height and density standards for LIMH uses, to provide for buffering of LIMH uses, to provide parking regulations for LIMH uses, to establish qualifying standards for LIMH properties, and to provide regulations for the expansion of LIMH and new uses onto adjacent properties. Is there a second? Thank you, Commissioner Kramer. Okay, this one, um, uh, Mr. Doyle, I think if you want to say a few words. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out if I can share the slides without <laughs> getting we'll just, we'll just put the game up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. The game's on Zoom. That's <laughs> this is not signed in Zoom. It's not signed in Zoom? No. Just the top. Takes <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, Having a technical difficulty here. We have no place to go. Why don't you? Awesome. Thank you, guys. So tonight, um, I'll be. Oh, oh, she's right there. Go ahead. I'll be presenting an ordinance that uh, introduces the uh, adoption of a low-income multifamily housing. Um, this is really just to recalibrate our code um, to what we had before with the old zoning code. Um, we did allow uh, low-income multifamily housing uh, in the old previous code for projects such as Ardmore Crossing. Ardmore House. Um, both of those projects were done under the old code. With the new adoption, um, we ran into some issues when we uh, uh, transitioned to the MDR district. The MDR district was then created to really address the, um, the, the omnipresent development of uh, apartment buildings within the township. And within that, um, we kind of 
overlooked uh, the nonprofit housing agencies that were within the township running both Armour Crossing, the Armour House, and then also a 13 state ASAFs, which is a um, six unit. The 13 state ASAFs is a slightly different from the other two projects that we looked at when we were creating the policy. Um, essentially, what we wanted to do was kind of create some compromise between what the zoning code was created for and how we wanted to accommodate the code for that. Thank you. So again, the purpose of this ordinance is to reestablish affordable housing as recognized land use by the amending the zoning code to specifically permit low-income multifamily housing as a type of multifamily housing. Again, the R6A provisions relating to the subsidized apartment housing for elderly and subsidized housing were never transitioned into the new code, like I said. So we're gonna make some calibrations here. Just to give you a background, the current zoning code um, has a, had a number of districts that R6A um, was then created into the MDR. Um, as you can see on the uh, Slide here. Oh, it's not going. Dude, what is this is All right, cool. All right, so you see in the purple right here are the MDR two properties. Um, there are about 450 of those within the township, which is about 2.5% of the, the properties. Um, altogether, there are about 500 property, 530 properties between the MDR2 and the MDR3, meaning there's about 70 MDR3. The MDR3 are important for us because what we were really doing was trying to compromise the, the nonprofits to be more like the, um, the MDR3 properties with, with a higher density. Um, so again, I, I kind of mentioned those, those three lots that we have. These are the only lots in the township that accommodate for nonprofit housing. The first being Ardmore House that was previously zoned to R6A. It was approved as a special exemption um, and as a subsidized apartment housing for the elderly. Again, the Ardmore Crossing, similar, uh, zoned in the R6A. Um, a smaller a, a, a lot that was approved as special exemption. The other one, 13 St. Asaphs, um, was in the R5 district but it was only a six unit uh, development, which is considered a small, a, a small multifamily within our um, code. So tonight I'd like to go over the uh, proposed amendments um, with you and, uh, and, and get your um, feedback, please. The first being uh, defining um, through, through section 155. The second, I'll go over some of the MDR form and design standards. Um, I'll just go over uh, quickly the use standards, parking standards, and then um, most importantly, reviewing Article 10, um, which really has a lot of the, the uh, freedoms for um, expansion of uh, existing non uh, existing nonconformities within the um, district. So to define uh, low-income multifamily housing was really important for us because we didn't have that before in our code. So well, we define it as a building or group of buildings containing a minimum of three residential dwellings. Um, and, and all these, th this definition is very much similar to both our small multifamily and our large multifamily, um, except for the end portion um, where it uh, has the, um, it'll be recorded in covenants to guarantee that each unit will be rented according to that Article 10 that I had mentioned before, which we'll go over later um, in this presentation. So uh, uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of, of zoning is uh, you know, the, uh, the underlying district. Um, what we did here was, uh, I'll, I'll go over some of the changes that we provided. Um, they're either proposed as accommodations to what we have existing so that we don't um, keep these existing non-conforming buildings, but rather provide an opportunity to uh, you know, reasonably expand within their districts. Um, the first is to uh, require a 100 foot minimum lot uh, frontage or lot width, I'm sorry, lot width, along with, uh, you know, very consistent with the, the same minimum uh, lot width that we have for the MD, MDR3 district. So that's the minimum that replicates that. The second here is um, a density requirement. And so 
we looked at uh, both Ardmore Crossing and the Ardmore House um, and came to the conclusion that uh, these properties were both at the greatest uh, 800 square foot per unit. So that's consistent with uh, those projects that we already have existing. Third here is uh, impervious surfaces. Um, the Ardmore House lot and a portion of the Ardmore Crossing where they do have the multifamily, both replicate that 80% impervious surface coverage. Um, and then we also have a frontage occupation of 50% minimum, um, which is really re reduced, as we'll talk about next, um, this campus style environment, um, which I, I'll have an example of too. Um, other requirements, um, we, we came to a conclusion that um, if you were adjacent to a property that was, uh, say, uh, of a higher upzone, um, then you would require uh, at least a five foot minimum. Uh, those that were lower require a 20 foot buffer. So those, those being like the MDR1 district yeah. or LDR district properties. And then finally to replicate, replicate the uh, maximum height, um, we looked at Ardmore House as at four stories or 52 feet. Um, we also looked at the frontage types and facade types and realized that um, as we uh, would assume that there would be some kind of expansion here, it would be more of a campus style expansion rather than um, you know, just expanding on the property um, with accessory units. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, the, the design accommodated for that and we're going to re um, eliminate that from any um, nonprofit agency that would be included. Uh, so here's a picture of the, the, you know, the, the frontage long um, county line of the Ardmore Crossing. Um, you'll see, if you, it's kind of tough to see on the screen here, maybe a little bit, but you'll see that this, th at, the, at the bottom here is that Ardmore Crossing, but it's, it's more built as a campus style environment to complement the other uh, the single family dwellings that are on. Um, there was also a requirement in the code just to recognize the fact that uh, we would be including um, low-income multifamily housing as a, as a recognized use. Um, so this is more just procedural um, as, as well as the use regulations. Uh, we did tie the use regulation again to that, those Article 10 requirements um, that I'll be talking about soon. Um, parking was important. Um, we wanted to address parking as uh, any of these um, low-income multifamily developments um, would be required one parking space. However, we did include a uh, half a parking space requirement when um, located within a half mile of SEPTA station. Um, the, these three developments are located within those that half a mile radius of uh, re respective SEPTA stations. And then again, as I spoke about in Article, um, article 10, we'd be amending 1014 um, to to really address the area median income. Um, one thing I do, I'm going to be asking for is uh, a change in this, in this code to go from instead of the proposed 50 to 60. So what I did is I, when I um, proposed this code earlier this week, um, I had some feedback from uh, local development. You know, we've reached out to all the nonprofit agencies to ask, you know, what, what did, what's kind of the environment right now for development? What would, what would be feasible? Uh, I got back from that um, projects could go up to 60%, not 50% of the area median income. Um, so that would change slightly to raise the, uh, the, the rates, um, but still making these projects extremely affordable um, for anyone renting. Um, but that would be able to flow projects in a, in a better manner uh, through financing. So in order to do that, um, we would change, uh, simply change um, this, the beginning here, I'll read it out to you. Uh, the, occupancy, the occupancy of a low income multifamily housing residential units is limited to only low income households having an income no greater than 60% of the current area median income as defined by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. There's a covenant running with the land that must be recorded limiting use of the property to such low-income households. The provider of any subsequent transferee of the low-income multifamily housing residential units on a property must be a single nonprofit corporation whose purpose is limited to providing affordable housing to low-income households. 
Providers are required upon request by the township to provide documentation showing compliance with family income and rental price limits. Um, so finally, again, as, as that read, there's a covenant with the land. Any subsequent transferee must be a single nonprofit corporation and the providers are required upon request at any time to show compliance with those um, income and, and rental price limits. Uh, it also includes, uh, 1014 also includes um, some changes to the requirements, again, of the MDR district um, to make sure that it, it, it allows for height limitations. Again, there's campus um, requirements, so uh, it would lax the primary frontage, the primary yard type, and primary facade, as we spoke about before. Um, and then that change in building plane that we saw that, that didn't comply with the Ardmore um, Crossing and Ardmore House as well. So tonight, I'd like you to consider a recommendation um, to authorize advertisement to amend Chapter 155 of the code. And then uh, along with that amendment uh, to the proposed Section 155, um, 1014 low-income multifamily housing to increase the area median income from 50% to 60%. Okay. Can I just ask you just one initial question? And yes. There might be an obvious answer to this, but why does someone who wants to take advantage of fit within these guidelines have to be a nonprofit? Suppose theoretically a for-profit developer wanted to do it. Um, we wanted to ensure that the, the, manage, the, the management would be a long-term um, invested partner with, uh, with both the township um, because they would need to be some kind of organization that would, that would be able to ensure that those developments would have uh, a long-lasting impact on the community. And they wouldn't, that wouldn't change ever. So um, if you had it be run by a for-profit agency, they could change it to uh, some kind of just regular development. Yeah, although if we're putting, a, and I, I, you had this slide, so I, which isn't up now, so I'm doing this from memory. But you had this slide that requires a covenant on the property that it has to stay low income housing. So, I mean, doesn't that protect the property from being somehow turning commercial? Uh, yeah, the covenant, the, yes, the covenant would. Right. Okay, I mean, I'm just not sure if there's a, maybe someone else knows why, but I, or maybe you do and I'm just not hearing you. But I'm not sure what the advantage is to us to limiting it if we have a protection, if a for-profit wanted to do this, that it has to be, you know, they can't be allowed to do it. I think log logistically we wanted, we intended it for that purpose so that we would make sure that it was a, a long-term commitment and, and that being a nonprofit agency, um, that, that was the intention. Other than that, uh, maybe it was maybe it was not good foresight to to include a nonprofit agency. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to see if others have questions. I mean, I have not. I'm not on the committee that's been discussing this, so I don't know if other members of the committee, either now or before this comes forward, um, Commissioner Stevenson, I see you raising your hand. Um, if you want to respond, you know, quickly, and then I'll see if others have questions. But yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I want to... Yes. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank um, Mr. Doyle for um, his presentation. I um, also want to thank the uh, members of the committee, um, um, Commissioners Kramer, Kramer, and um, Zoloff for being a part of this uh, this committee. Um, this this work, what, first of all, what he's outlined is a complicated piece that we're trying to do. You know that with affordable housing, we're constantly trying to look of creative ways to make it work. And what Mr. Doyle has come up with is an uh, alternative way to, number one, look at a way that we can create an ordinance that ensures that we have an opportunity for nonprofits piece to fit what we want to do with Armour House and other areas like that. The other reality of it is to get it done in a way that it would we can get in an expedited way and, and because of a timeline we have. And the third piece is the reality that we're dealing with is that by doing this, it does not get a cog in the wheel of debate about of the, of the NIMBY process because the reality of it is there's a lot of resistance and a lot of work goes into if we try to blanket across the board by doing it in this way. 
I think it gives us opportunity to fit the need that we have now about this opportunity and this particular project, but it also, and Mr. Doyle can correct me if I'm wrong, it also gives us an opportunity to come back and revisit this if we want to relook at it for other opportunities as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, why don't we see if commissioners, uh, other commissioners have any questions or, or comments? Um, Commissioner Gilda Kramer, why don't you go first? I just wanted to say that um, our um, affordable housing committee was unanimous in support for this. And that this um, is necessary for us to proceed with the Ardmore House project and the expansion of the St. Asaph's property by the Lower Marion Affordable Housing Corporation. And it's narrow, and I urge everyone to support it. Thank you. Commissioner Courtney. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, I'm, I, I always hate to see impervious surface increases. Um, can, I, can I assume that any sort of requirements we have around stormwater management in regard to installing basins and other drainage is, is still, still applies? Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, the situation in like Ardmore House right now, they, they wouldn't, they, their previous approval wasn't required to have stormwater remediation. So if, you know, if there were an expansion to happen, it would actually improve the, the conditions on both properties. Okay, great. great. And then um, in our commercial zoning, uh, we required an affordable housing incentive to go up to four stories. Safe to say we probably don't need to incentivize that here. Uh, so I, I think that's great. Uh, we received public comment on uh, the parking requirement where the, the commenter, he didn't cite his source, but he said that 0.36 cars per unit was an accepted uh, standard. And I'm wondering how we arrived at 0.5 and do we actually need that much parking? Um, so we did. Again, I mentioned before that we mimicked much of this code uh, from other pieces that, would, that were um, similar. We do have parking for uh, elderly, but that's limited to a certain, we have, like, we allow for um, reduced parking at 0.5 for the elderly homes already. So that was the same to replicate those requirements. Okay, okay. Uh, and then la last question, there's a change in the ordinance around the I think it's the side yard buffer. The, the current ordinance says that the buffer should apply uh, according to the, the, the adjacent zone. And we're saying it's just 20 feet here. Is that reducing, increasing the, the buffer? So if it's, if it's up zone, if there's a property that's up zone to it, it reduces it by five feet. Okay. Um, but if it's lower than that, it actually increases to a buffer that's 20 feet, which is uh, larger than the requirement. Okay, I, I, not, I think I followed that. I, I guess it's just a question of like, do, do we need to have a special case here? Uh, is the 20 foot buffer actually, like, is it necessary to say specifically that versus what we already have in the code? Um, I think because we are, uh, my intention here was because we are increasing this to replicate the MDR3 district, okay. it actually echoes that that same um, requirement in that MDR three district, where the down zone properties are actually required that twenty foot buffer, so it replicates that MDR three requirement there. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for my questions. I'll just quickly comment. I think this is great. Uh, it's it's an excellent move by us to codify what we mean when we say lower income housing, and I think it's great that we are changing these non-conforming structures into conforming in case they ever need to make modifications or renovations that won't be severely impactful to our existing stock. And hopefully this will encourage other nonprofit agencies to consider developments in Lower Marion Township. Thanks. Thank you. President Sinai. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, I, I, want to, uh, uh, I want to start by uh, commending staff in the, in the committee for, for bringing this forward. Um, I think someone noted um, that you know we don't find opportunities to do this very often, and we should take advantage of those opportunities when they arise. Uh, this seems like one of those opportunities, and we'd be glad to support it. Uh, let me first address uh, Commissioner Grimes' question about for-profit versus non-profit. I appreciate where he's coming from. Um, you know, and I'm not in the committee. This is the first time you know I'm, I'm hearing about this issue, but 
Uh, there, is, there is a body of, of, of research on it, whether it's in the LIHTC program or, or these uh, uh, you know, low and moderate income uh, properties. And what you find is that a for-profit developer, a for-profit owner, somehow miraculously has families in it that are exactly at the AMI cutoff, right? The highest possible income for the highest possible rent that they could charge while still staying within the limits. Uh, a nonprofit owner might do that as well, but doesn't necessarily have the same financial incentive to do so. Um, all else equal, I would choose a nonprofit owner if we're going to try and uh, achieve our affordability um, uh, objectives. Uh, so with that, I just have a few questions um, because I wasn't part of the committee. So, so um, you, you, you advocate for raising to 60% of, of AMI. Um, again, that, that, that sort of, I, I understand where that's coming from. Um, my, my reading of the code is that like, every unit has to be 60% or below um, of the ordinance. Um, sometimes these things are blended, right? Some fraction have to be at 30%, some fraction have to be at 50%. Some fraction have to be a 60%, so you get a blend of, of income. So, so, so why this approach and not like the, not the, the, the mix of income approach? As far as uh, requiring a blend of and then up Yeah, to. I mean, just, there are different ways this is done. You, got, you guys, you, the, the committee you chose, okay, all of the units need to be below you know, 60%. There, 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 there are several different thresholds that are typically used. 80% of AMI, 50% right. of AMI, 30% of AMI. Um, and sometimes you'll see developments where the rules for the, for, the, for the property are half the units have to be at 80% of AMI or below, 30% have to be at 50% of AMI or below, and 20% have to be at 30% of AMI or below. You yeah. nailed it on the head. So PHFA, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance yeah. Agency, actually does require that you have, to, in order to be eligible for those, um, the, the grant, you have to have a blending of those. And they allow you to go up to 60% of the, um, the HUD income. So that's why I changed it before we had it 50. And we were like, all right, let's just make sure everything, you know, because there were examples within the township right now, um, being the Armour House, that they're just not up to that, that. But I'd like to create it up to 60, now realizing that you can go up to that to get to float a prop, a, a, land development plan that, that would be viable. Got it. So if I understand it, to get the, to get the, the, the benefits in the zoning code, you just have to be at 60% or below. To Correct. get funding currently from PHFA, then you need to have a blend. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, makes sense. Uh, so in, in an AMI, we're talking about the geography is county AMI. That's how HUD defines it? It, the, uh, it sounds like a thing. HUD actually defines it. We, we, we would say Montgomery County, yeah. but actually it's the Philadelphia metro area. So that's, and right now that's $112,000. Okay, but that's the geography, because the geography is not in the code, right? It just says it says <laughs> area median income. It doesn't say what area, and it's just the HUD definition of AMI that applies to our area. Correct. If that changes in the future, it will be whatever that is. Every year it does the same thing for our, um, for our moderate income housing um, okay. requirement as well. Okay, and then the last question is, and I think I see, I, I, I just want to confirm what I think I read in the code. Um, so if we allow a property to be built to four stories, less setbacks, less parking, and it transfers ownership and the new owner says, yeah, I can't really do this property under the income limits and I, I need to make it into a regular property. You know, we're not going to make them knock down a floor. Um, they're, they're, they were basically just required to run vacancy, right? Like, I mean, they, the, the covenant says that they have to. I, yeah, I, I guess this, this was written in faith that you know, there would always be some perpetual um, you know, ownership of this that would be responsible. To, probably a safe bet that there'll always be a need, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that would run with the, you know, whatever um, mechanism of funding that would be acquired for the property and the, and the development. Okay. But yes, I mean, potentially, yes, that, that could be, that is a, a scenario that could happen. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grants. Thank you. Um, any other commissioner questions, comments? Oh, commissioner Stevenson, I will not consider your responding to my question to be a comment, so you're welcome to do that now. Well, I <clears throat> I was not, I was wanted to say a couple of things. One is that um, Ms. Uh, Marion uh, Phillips, who is the chair of the Art My House, um, couldn't be there today, but wanted me to um, um, make a comment that they are support of this and they've been working with, with they've been working a lot with them in the last um, 
um, month um, and the months over this. So we're, we're happy for them to be a part of that. And secondly, just want to again, just emphasize that um, this project has been an ongoing work that they've been doing. And I appreciate all the work that the, the staff has been doing towards it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, now, oh, Commissioner McComb. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gosh. Just a quick question. First of all, I support this and uh, appreciate the work the staff and the staff and the, and the committee did. I, I don't want to prolong the discussion, but uh, Commissioner Grimes, you had a question about why the covenant, if you if it's limited, and isn't it sort of a belt and suspenders? And I'm just wondering, thinking out loud, whether the covenant wouldn't require us to litigate it as opposed to just preventing um, a, a, a for-profit from trying to flip the property. I'm just trying to. Th I think there probably is a. I'm not going to call on our solicitor, but it, it seems to me that making sure that there isn't a problem is easier than finding out there's a problem then litigating and then displacing people or something like that. So it sort of makes sense from that perspective, although I, I take it, you know, it, it, it wasn't really all that clear. Yeah, no, thank you. And just to be clear, you know, I'm happy to support this. I was just asking my question because as someone who hasn't been involved in this, that was a sort of a natural thing where we're trying to to bring more public, more affordable housing to the township. It's not a question that I'm pressing, but I appreciate your your thought on that is additional explanation as to maybe why it wasn't pursued. Yeah, I'm not a real estate expert, but yeah. that my gut sense yeah. is that may be true. And I, I think it's it's a fair fair question. So that that's all I had. So yeah, thank you. thanks. Did you want to explain and add something? I've been working with the assistant township manager in parallel with what Mr. Doyle's been doing. We've been looking at um, with supporting the committee at potential developers and how some of these could get funded. Um, Looking at different grants and coming in later today, we realized that if we remove that phrase nonprofit, it would open up potentially more um, funding for potential projects going forward. I appreciate Commissioner Sinai's comments, but I think if we could remove that, that phrase nonprofit, um, it would still, it would allow um, more firms to be able to bid at these. Um, certainly somebody's going to be doing this. They need to make money doing it, but there's somebody, there's not, it's not a, money, a lot of money in affordable housing because the rents are so small. Um, but we shouldn't have to listen, limit it to a nonprofit. Um, and to Commissioner's um, um, point, is the covenant's really the most important thing here going right. forward? But we would recommend striking the word nonprofit. Well, since I'm the one who, and thank you for the comments, it, it, you know, since I'm the one who raised the subject, I'm going to say this. I have, after listening to others, I have become more aware that this is a time sensitive matter. And I don't know that I would be comfortable myself proposing an amendment to my own motion tonight without knowing more about the subject because, as I've said before, this is not, I'm not on the Affordable Housing Committee and it's not something I've delved into. So if another commissioner wants to propose that, that's certainly fine, but I'm not, yeah, I think it's something to explore, but I'm not willing to go out on a limb and ask for that tonight. So I, I see no one raising their hand so um, we will just move move on but thank you Chris for the the comment and I think it's something maybe we should uh, look into a little more to see if it makes sense um, public comment um, I'm, I'm really happy to see this and I understand uh, the sense of urgency I have been Frustrated sometimes that our zoning code rewrite, as good as it was, did result in some nonconformities unintentionally. And this opportunity to allow some um, existing properties to actually be documented as they exist, which was our, our zoning philosophy, you know, recording what is, um, and now maybe allow these properties to region, reasonably expand, I think is great. Um, I, I do like the idea of maybe looking forward and seeing if my, maybe there are other developers who could come into our area and provide some additional affordable housing for our uh, residents, those who work here in particular. Um, I did actually send this forward to a friend of mine who works at Mission First Housing Group. I had some experience with them previously, and I believe they are for profit, uh, when they did some affordable housing for veterans, um, taking advantage of tax credits. Very, very knowledgeable people, very uh, rooted in this area. Um, I think this is all really, really good. But I don't think it's ready for publication yet. And some of it has to do with simple definitions and the percentages. Um, 
as a, a simple example, if we're going to talk about HUD AMI, area median income, HUD language is that 50% of the area median income is very low income. 80% is low income, 30% is extremely low income. Those are, that's language that's pretty much out there and every, all those who are in this business know that and I think we should be clear and consistent with it as well. I think the effort to look at the tax credits and to consult with PHFA is excellent. Again, I think it should be consistent there. Um, and I would say that when we get into rewriting this, then we may need to take a step back and look at our definition of affordable so that both the moderate income incentives that are available as well as the low income or very low income housing um, uses are, are complementary and both identified. I do believe there's a broader issue though, and I brought this to the attention of staff in the past and without bogging this effort down, I would ask for a commitment to address this in the future, sir. Um, and that's the treatment of twins, duplexes, quads, and small multifamily. We don't in this township uh, define triplex, and our definition of quad is somewhat inconsistent with the definition at the county level. If our property records are maintained at the county level, then we should have similar definitions here at the township level for quad and triplex, and we don't. Um, we right now have most of those um, zoned MDR2, and yet, the bulk of quads and 80% of the existing triplexes, and we do have 85 triplexes in our community, which are all lumped in, I guess, as small multifamily, they're all in, 80% of them are in MDR1. There's, there, there's some digging that has to be done. You need to rack and stack our small multifamily, our twins, our duplexes, our triplexes, and our quads, and get those straight in the code, because right now, you now have 68 non-conformities of people who own triplexes and that's just not fair that 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 part of the zoning code we didn't get right and we need to go back and do it um, minor issues with this i would suggest potentially looking at parking again not just the 3.6 that commissioner courtney brought up but potentially um, through maybe a conditional use that if the low-income multifamily housing is available near a bus stop or a heavy walk, walkable area, similar to the maps that we looked at last week with pedestrian, then the parking could be reduced as well. Um, and then the only other thing is um, the additional note on uh, table 4.2.2. I wasn't sure if that buffer only pertained to the low-income multifamily housing or if that was for everybody in MDR2. I just think there's some cleanup and edits that could go into this thoughtfully, um, either within the next week before it goes to the Board of Commissioners or perhaps without belaboring it too much um, before you fully adopt it, because I don't think it's ready for publication just yet. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Um, no one online, I take it. Okay. We did receive a uh, written comment from Ethan Frank who wrote about parking and building height as it relates to the proposed ordinance that we're discussing. Um, we thank Mr. Frank and note that all commissioners received a copy of his comments, which will go in the record. Um, okay, um, was there any uh, anyone who would like to respond to the public comment? All right, I, I see no one, but thank you, Ms. Gillen. Uh, we'll then call for the call the vote. Um, all those in, in favor, favor of, of the motion, motion raise your hand, signify aye. Any, any opposed? opposed? Seeing, Seeing none. none. Mm -hmm. any, any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion carries. President Sinai, that concludes building and planning for tonight. Thank you very much, Commissioner Grimes, and everyone. Uh, that is concludes the business of the Board of Commissioners of Longmire Township for this evening. Have a good evening, everyone.